Welcome back to the Nimzo Indian Masterclass that I'm making. This is now chapter eight. And in this chapter, we're going to be diving deep into the Nimzo Indian with 4A3. This is known as the Samish variation. And although not so good, it is something that is quite common and important to know how to deal with. Now, A3 doesn't make too much sense because the only times a3 makes sense is if this knight is defended with a piece, for example, in the classical system, because after a3, we're motivated to take, and then their idea was to take back with the piece and get our two bishops while maintaining their pawn integrity. But by playing a3 so early, we can take, and they have to recapture, and now they've wasted a move with a3, and they still have this ruined pawn structure, so it just frankly doesn't make too much sense. Now, even though a3 doesn't make too much sense, it has been tried sometimes, and specifically a3 uh, complemented by the move f3. Together, these two moves have been tried, uh, and White's idea is to get a big pawn mass in the center, because after a3, bishop takes, pawn takes, together with a3 and f3, e4 is the obvious attempt, and after e4, there's going to be a big mass in the center. And white is wasting a ton of time by playing all of these pawn moves. But of course, the benefit is indeed the fact that they're going to get a big pawn mass. This is not so dangerous and it's easy to disarm. And we'll talk about how to do this. But this is the main idea with a3. Aside from that, if they play any other option aside from f3, then it really doesn't make too much sense whatsoever. Because why would they weaken their structure like this? Additionally, what you're going to see is that playing, if they want to play f3 and a3 together, very often they're going to start by playing f3, which is going to be the next chapter we cover, because by playing a3, they give us more flexibility, and I'll explain why. In this position, we're going to castle. We're not committed to anything. They're not threatening to play uh, e4 immediately, so we don't have to play d5. We're just waiting here, and our structure is going to consist now of actually d6 and c5 to highlight these misplaced pawns. Against f3 first, they're threatening to go e4, so we're encouraged to go d5 quickly. And the idea now is that uh, we no longer have that flexibility to choose to play d6 and then c5. We've already played d5. And so very often, this is what they're going to play. It's a stronger option, and we're going to debunk this in the next video. But here we're going to play, um, we're going to look at a3. Another thing I must mention is with d6, we're not only going for c5, very often we're going to play e5 as well. Uh, but generally, if we play on these dark squares, um, including e5 again, uh, I, I must say, then they can't get rid of this pawn structure. So e5 is still a great option. We're not only going c5, but the key is not to go d5 or, for some reason, b5. That's the thing that I should emphasize. We're going to castle, and here they have four options. The first option is e3, and I can quickly throw this one already out because we've already covered this very position. If you remember from the uh, from the variation where they start by playing 4e3 and follow that up with a3, which we looked at very early on in this masterclass, we got this exact structure, in fact, this exact position where we play d6. And now, uh, this is one of my goals is to uh, sort of repeat lines, make these lines very consistent so you can use similar ideas from lines you've already seen in different uh, transpositions. And so here, again, we covered very deeply this position where we looked at many options. Uh, very often we can we continued with e5, e4. Uh, so if you need a refresher, I'd encourage you to watch uh, the videos on e3, on move 4, and then on move 5, a3. That uh, will remind you ab about this exact position we covered very deeply again. But we don't have to cover this now, which is the benefit. And instead, we're going to look at knight to f3, we're going to look at bishop to g5, and we're going to look at, of course, f3. Uh, so let's begin with knight to f3. Against knight f3, we again play d6. We want this dark square structure. d5 is a fine move, but it just doesn't align with a consistent strategy because, again, at any point, they'll be able to take. So d6 is my recommendation. Uh, so d6, let's say they continue with e3, then b6. They continue something, uh, bishop to b7, and ultimately we're going to play c5. Now we have many, many ideas. 
One of the ideas is to go knight c6, knight a5 to attack this pawn. Another idea is to go c5 to stop this pawn from ever pushing forward and getting rid uh, of itself, uh, getting rid of the weakness it, it uh, itself is. Uh, another potential idea is to get rid of this defender. We're not going to play bishop a6 typically here because we've already moved the bishop, but we can actually get rid of this defender in a very creative way. We can go bishop e4. This is something to know. Uh, where I'll play it here just to, to show you, maybe it's the best move in the position, to be honest, but it's a common idea in many of these positions where if they take, now we can continue targeting these weaknesses with our knights and they can't defend them with the bishops. And if they ever attack this knight, we can stabilize it with f5. Very common idea where the knight is super strong. This other knight will also be very strong soon with c5 still coming. And now the benefit is we can also attack on this other side of the board, uh, funnily enough, with perhaps trading this knight for this knight via this g5 square and then going for some attack. So our ideas are plentiful in this uh, situation and knight f3 is not an issue for us. Now let's look at bishop to g5. We play h6. Let's say they take. We're also going to look at bishop h4 momentarily. Knight f3, d6, e3. We can play knight c6 and Remember, uh, in the beginning of the video, I talked about how we're not only going for c5 and this sort of dark square setup. Uh, very often, we're also going for e5, as here it makes a ton of sense because they have many pieces here. e5 makes sense. You could alternatively, I mean, flexibility is key, right? So you could also play b6 and most, uh, more likely than not, you're going to continue uh, with b6 here at some point, maybe when they attack this pawn. You can also then target this. I mean, you can play on both sides of the board, but here uh, I just wanted to emphasize that e5 is a good way uh, to play because now the bishop can also come here and we can play e4 in a moment. And this all kind of stems from the fact that the queen comes here. So I think that's one of the signals that e5 is a good idea. The queen is on the king side, so it makes sense to play also on the king side. But I just want to show you the flexibility with the setup, not only c5, and d6 as we've seen, but very much so also e5 and playing on the king side. Uh, if we go back after bishop h4, we can see this again. We play d6 and then knight b to d7, and now again e5, right? We're still going, by the way, you know, after rook e8, we're still going for c5. We can mix these things. Uh, you know, for here we're threatening to take, and then we're going to have pressure over here on the pawn. c5 will be good to immobilize these pawns and continue our dark square uh, sort of parade on the board and we're just generally very happy playing on these dark squares the knight eventually can reroute in a variety of ways letting this bishop shine or the bishop can develop over here flexibility i must again stress is very much apparent in this opening you as long as you play with a dark square structure you can go about this position in a million different ways, uh, which is what makes this position so fun, right? You can try different things out and none of the moves are going to be too committal. I mean, playing b6 versus playing, you know, even g5 or versus playing knight f8, they're all going to be relatively similar in, a, in the evaluation being relatively good for us. And therefore, you have the freedom to play whatever style you like to play. That uh, said, we're now going to look at f3, which is the most dangerous setup, the most common uh, matching a3 and f3 together. We're going to play d6, and now we're going to play knight to c6. And here specifically, e5 is a common idea because they have all this pawn mass over here, so we want to play as much in the center as we can, but c5 is definitely not uh, something to rule out ever, really. So bishop to d3, we're going to play b6, and here we can look at a number of options. After f4, we go e5, and takes, takes, and they push, and now knight jumps to a5, and we get a very similar thing to what we've seen many times already, where on one side, we're playing against this weakened pawn over here, uh, and we can get many pieces involved on the attack over here, and on the other side, uh, something to note, we're playing against this uh, king that is still in the center. Again, you have flexibility of ideas and plans. You have so many ways to go about this position. I, I really love playing with this sort of flexibility. Uh, so this would be good for us. 
and that's obviously if they go ultra aggressive with f4, they can play more conservatively with like knight e2, but then after knight f5, a5, bishop a6, uh, we can trade queens. Of course, if we do, then the issue for them is this weakness over here. So they won't trade, they'll try to keep defending, but then uh, we can play h6, good move to restrict their bishop. We don't want their bishop to start harassing this knight, but ultimately we're going for c5. Where after takes, takes, their queen is forced back. We can win a pawn here, um, and happy days. I mean, we have good control also on this d-file. We have the dark square control that we really seeked from the opening, and we won the pawn that we were trying to fight against. This is a, a golden dream situation. So going back, that is a, a possibility for them to go knight e2. Bishop g5 is another plan before we play h6 if they want to throw this move in, but it's not dangerous. h6, again e5, again knight a5, g5, we've already seen as well, very dark square heavy position. You can imagine the knight landing on this f4 square. It would be an absolute beast, right? And, and again, bishop a6 we've seen as well. So many similarities here. I mean, you're sort of getting the same ideas again and again in all of these positions, which makes this opening so easy to play. So the target on this pawn is something to remember. The knight coming over here, and we can trade this big defender and then even win further. The queen has a beautiful place to sit on f6 where it sort of patrols over these diagonals. It's a great position, guys. It's a, it's a great position for us. And uh, that is basically it. So against this a3 setup, we get very calm positions where it seems like we are the only ones with plans and targets. The most aggressive uh, way to play this is with f3, but as I mentioned multiple times, this is not the right move order. We're going to cover the more dangerous move order, starting with 4f3 instead of a3 in the next video, so stay tuned to that. Uh, and like this video if you did learn something new from it, and enjoy it. Subscribe if you're new around here and want more content just like this, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace out.